Easter eggs, endings explained, and season 2 predictions, these will all be yours as I, Heavy Spoilers, discuss all things One Piece. I'm super excited to talk about the show, and throughout this video, we're going to be going through it all. One Piece is an incredible series, and I'm happy to say that it breaks the tradition, and now we finally have a decent live action anime adaptation. First though, just a quick word from our sponsors, and then we'll get right into the video. Now today's video is sponsored by Bloodline Heroes of Lithus. This is a dark fantasy hero collector RPG that I have to say has one of the most unique game gacha gameplays that I've ever seen. With its innovative air system and breathtaking visuals, Bloodline takes RPGs and gacha gameplays to an entirely new level. It's absolutely free to play as well, and you can download it by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code on the screen right now. Customize your champions by marrying any two bloodlines of elves, demons, demigods, orcs, dwarves, lichen, dragonborn, vampires, and so on. This can create over 4,000 fantasy hybrids and endless possibilities for your lineups and matchmaking strategies. The hybrids inherit not only the talents and traits of their parents, but also their unique appearances, passed down from each family tree and fused into one. New bloodlines with unique abilities and companions form new genders and they're released every two weeks. The game's also designed with stunning graphics to provide a top tier visual experience on mobile phones and smart pads. Enjoy collecting fantasy characters in full 3D graphics, that's definitely one of the best mobile games that I've ever seen. All players can combine uniquely designed hybrid champions, bloodcraft legends by earning points in seasonal guild wars. Raise heirs with companions slash waifus, and you can switch genders of companions freely. Build your own kingdom and economy with strategic gameplay and witness the beautiful scenes and interesting storylines. Download the game for free now on both Android and iOS by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code. You also get a special starter pack worth $20 by using my link, and this contains 1 summoning crystal, 100,000 gold, and on top of this you get 100 diamonds. The first 30 players who leave their in-game account ID and username in the first pinned comment section below will receive a legendary female succubus champion, a luxuriant, one of the best mages to carry you in the game. Huge thank you to Bloodline Heroes of Lithis for supporting this video, and I'm going to see you in the next part of the breakdown. Now over the years we've had some truly atrocious live action anime adaptations like Dragon Ball Evolution, Death Note, Cowboy Bebop and so on. In a world where source material is ignored and mocked, in the case of The Witcher, or fans expectations are subverted for no reason, the passion and sheer love for the iconic manga and anime is clear from the off. The show perfectly condenses major parts of the thousand plus episode and chapter long anime to bring us what I think is an incredible start to the series that I hope goes on for a long time. Just like The Last of Us, the majority of the manga and anime is adapted almost one for one, except some changes to the pacing and Arlong becoming the season's big bad. Now, the One Piece creator was heavily involved with the creation of the Netflix show, and whilst other series and movies adapting beloved comics and games tell our actors not to read or play the source material, we know from what the cast members have said that they were heavily invested in it. Emily Rudd, who plays Nami, and Ainaki, who plays Luffy, are big fans of the original source material, which obviously shows as they bring these layered characters to life. Which means that there's someone, somewhere, cooking. But if you're joining us and have no clue what One Piece is, then for the first part of the video, let's, let's break the whole thing down. Now, One Piece is a weekly manga comic series running from 1997 all the way up to present day. It was serialized in Weekly Shonen Jump, which features many different mangas, and it's also been adapted into an equally long-running anime. It's considered one of the big three of anime, and this is alongside Naruto and also Bleach. Now, the story of One Piece follows the exploits of Monkey D. Luffy as he sets out in his own words to become the King of the Pirates. 24 years ago, Gold D. Roger was executed at his place of birth, Logetown, which is where the missing arc takes place during the anime in present day. He states that he hid all of the treasure known as the One Piece on an island at the end of the Grand Line, and in his final words, he challenges people to go and find it. <laughs> it led to a golden age of piracy, like when LimeWire came out, and this is the opposite to what the world government want. If you're paying close attention to the scene, you can also catch a young Dracul Mihawk, along with Shanks, who become big characters later on. In the source material, Garp was not actually at the execution, and he was sent by Goldie Roger to find and protect his son. Now, the pair had a sort of uneasy alliance after their fighting, and this is sort of alluded to when Garp tells Kobe how they work with the pirates. The intro to the show is also the start of the manga, and the intro to every episode is pulling from the anime. 
Season 1 pretty much follows the story of the East Blue Saga, which is the main arc that starts off the entire source material. We also have a pre and post time skip split up as well, but all you need to know is really that Season 1 follows the East Blue. However, the final arc, which is Logetown, is missing, and I'm guessing that this is going to pop up at some point in Season 2. Now we end as the crew are about to enter the Grand Line after they get the map. Logetown, which is where Goldie Roger was born and died, is the first stop before the Grand Line, and the entrance to that is in the Reverse Mountain. Now that was hinted at when Nami looked at the map in Episode 8, and all the seas converge to lead up to the mountain. Now your first question probably is, what is the Grand Line? Well it's an ocean route that runs the entire world, but it's incredibly dangerous. The world in one piece is actually made up of the East Blue, the West Blue, the North Blue and the South Blue Seas, with the Red Line and Grand Line wrapping around the worlds. Entering the Grand Line is very perilous, as we saw when Don Krieg was trying to enter and was defeated by Dracul. The adaptation has changed things up and aimed to make things more traditional, like a Western TV season. For example, we get our big bad of Season 1, which is Arlong, who stands in the way of Luffy getting his map of the Grand Line. He needs this in order to get to the One Piece, and this will help him become the King of the Pirates. Arlong is shown to be above Buggy, and we discover that he's controlling a fearsome group of pirates. Arlong is one of the fishmen who were enslaved by humanity, and though they're now free, there's still a lot of prejudice towards them. Now, their species home is Fishman Island, but it's segregated with the poor and orphan fishmen like Arlong shunted off it. It's here that Arlong's hatred festered, and using their strength and incredible abilities, they decided to mount up and take over most of the villages. They forced the citizens to give them tribute, which has made them extremely rich, and Arlong's invulnerability has made him almost invincible. Now it appears that he wants the Grand Line map from Axe Hand, and this will give him the location of every naval base from Arlong Park to the Goa Kingdom. Him having the map would make him supremely powerful, and it would give him the ability to take over society. Now this change of him being the big bad of the whole season, and the East Blue live action really cements Luffy and the crew's win over him as a big, big deal. As mentioned, the whole of the season setting up the crew getting together, and we aren't bogged down too much in exposition as the blending of the flashbacks works. Now it's during some of these that we learn of Luffy's backstory, and how he got the powers from the gum gum devil fruit. These fruits are scattered around the world, and users are able to gain power unique to that fruit. However, it doesn't allow them to swim, which I always found to be a bit of a weird caveat, as it doesn't seem to hinder many, except for Luffy. Now an important thing to bear in mind is that if a devil fruit user is killed, their ability appears in a devil fruit in a random pot of the world, which allows the power to be passed on. There are also artificial devil fruits made using a scientist named Vegapunk's research, which will be a major storyline probably popping up in the far future. Now Luffy of course is given stretchy powers, and in my opinion they look really good, and I kinda hope Kevin Feige's watching this somewhere and taking down notes. Now as mentioned, Luffy's life goal is to become King of the Pirates, and on his travels he meets a character called Zoro. We meet him on Sixes Island, along with Mr. Seven, and can also see the legend of the sacred burning beast of Baltimore. This is a deep cut reference to Frankly, who appears around the time of Water 7, where he appeared like a flaming beast. Now this Mr. Seven is another m amazingly deep cut, as he's known as Mr. Seven previous, as he was previously mentioned by Zoro during the Arabaster arc. He was shown in a crude drawing during the SBS chapter, which is basically a Q&A section in the collected volumes. Now we will discuss Baroque works a bit later in the video, as we discuss the predictions for season 2 and get a, a little bit spoilery. Later in the show, we also learn more of Zoro's backstory, which going off the anime is actually my favourite backstory of all the crew. Now his rival is the daughter of a dojo leader, but she's much more fleshed out in the original anime. We learn how her father said she cannot be the strongest as she's a girl, and while Zoro isn't as skillful, he will eventually become much stronger naturally over time. Now, the pair gained respect after fighting 2,000 times, but sadly she would trip on the stairs, and he never got the chance to be what he considered to be the best swordsman. Now alongside him on the crew is Nami, who's desperate to make a map of the entire world. We learn throughout the course of her specific episodes that she was adopted by a former marine and has adapted a sister in Nojiko. Nami was originally from the Okyok Kingdom where her adopted mother found her and they ended up going to Koko Village. In the past, Arlong and his crew arrived and ordered the place to give them protection money and over time this became ruinous. Nami's mother was killed trying to protect her when the table setting gave away that there were more people who lived there. Nami eventually became an employee of Arlong and was hated by her sister and the rest of Koko Village. However, she actually had an agreement to buy the freedom of her village and that was actually what she was working away on. 
Now when we join her in the show, she's working to simply steal the map of the Grand Line and get enough berries to help buy her freedom. However, she's played by Orlong and the Marine Captain, who both work together to get the millions of berries she's stashed. Now Luffy meets both Zoro and Nami at Shellstown, which largely goes down the same way in the source material. Complete with rice balls, we see as Luffy works with Nami to get the map, which she of course secretly wants so she can help out Arlong. Now things do differ slightly from the manga and anime here, but I did like what the show included in Shellstown. As Luffy arrives, we see there's a number of wanted posters hanging up, which in the lineup includes Cavendish. Cavendish is probably my favourite easter egg in the show, and he appears during an arc later on that's very well loved, making him a, an iconic pirate. Anyway, Axe Hand's defeated, and we close out the entry with Kobe following his dreams to become a marine. Thematically, the series is all about following your dreams, and we see this is echoed in several characters throughout. Luffy, of course, wants to become the king of the pirates, Zoro wants to be the world's greatest swordsman, and Sanji wants to get ingredients from the old blue. I love how there's also this idea that the elder generation are happy to help out the younger ones, and this is reflected in Grandpa, Mihawk, and Chef Zeth. Even at the end with Luffy's grandfather, we see as he asks the marines what they follow, as they of course follow orders whilst the crew follow their dreams. He even says he gave Luffy every opportunity to follow his path, and this is idea laced throughout the show. They're very supportive because they believe children are our future, and for them to get where they are, they also had to have someone who helped support them. Several characters refuse to step in the way of the others following theirs, and it's a very inspirational direction to take the entire series. Kobe of course goes off to join the marines and we watch as the crew make their escape which leads them into the path of Buggy. Buggy himself has a major pass working with Shanks on Goldie Roger's ship and he's played by the splendid Jeff Ward who played Deacon Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. The CGI on the devil fruit and the chop chop fruit looks fantastic and Buggy's is equally hilarious as he is terrifying. He's one of the big teasers at the end of the season and he starts off here desperate for the Grand Line map. It's a close fight as Luffy's trapped in a water tank to get the map back as he can't swim due to the devil fruit powers. Now, the fight is superb but it's heavily shortened with the lion tamer and such not being as involved. It's at this point Garp finally decides to go after Luffy through using Kobe who's now a proper cadet. Now, Garp was actually not as involved in the anime at this point and it wasn't revealed until the Water 7 arc that he was actually Luffy's grandfather. He's introduced much much earlier which I feel works way better and the showrunners of course have the 2020 hindsight to bring in elements like this earlier. Agop is simply using his great resources as a vice admiral to chase down his increasingly powerful grandson. This is to make sure that he's dedicated to following his dreams as he is of course going to be in order to achieve how grand they are. Now through the scenes with Garp, Helmapo and Kobe, we learn the marines in world government use the warlords of the sea to do their bidding. These are great and powerful pirates which do the jobs that the government can't really get involved in. Now Usopp is the next person to join the crew, how we meet him in Syrup Village. He's dreamed of a life of adventure like Luffy and tells tales to his friend Kaya. He's basically the boy who cried wolf, but rather than screaming about a canine, he's constantly shouting that the pirates are coming. Now much is missing from his series debut, as he had some kids that followed him round and acted like his sort of crew, but they never really left their own piece of the world. He does keep his abilities though with his keen marksmanship and later in the show even uses the exploding star on the villain Chu. Now the pair work really well off each other with both wanting to become the leader and it gets to a point where they even make their own flags. This is also where we get to see the first major ship the crew get which we learn is called the Going Merry. Later on they get one called the Thousand Sunny but that happens much later during the Water 7 arc. Usopp with his tall tails tries to get them a deal on the ship named after its creator who's killed by Kuro. However, this butler is actually indeed Kuro and we see that he's part of the Black Cat gang. He was actually teased early on as the Black Cat pirates were said to be taken out by Axe Hand and his portrait was in the safe with the Grand Line map. Now we learn that he's faked his death and managed to take control of Kaya to gain her immense wealth. Aesop's backstory is largely rushed through but it exists to simply show his growth from a boy who idolises pirates and pretends they're coming to someone who has to take on pirates himself and become a powerful person. He ends up having a kiss with Kaya and they certainly seem to make it more explicit here with there being a clear romantic spark. Now she does appear over the course of the story and I'm guessing that she'll be back to keep up with the events of the crew. As we see, Usopp becomes immensely attached to the Going Merry, and it is sort of an extension of her, or at least he sees it that way. Now the crew have yet one more member to get, as they need a cook for the travel across the Grand Line. 
This is more explicitly stated in the anime, and here they head out to Baratai. It's here they meet Sanji, who, to me, felt, you know, I, I did like him, but he was just a bit off from the anime. In that, he completely simps for women all the time, like, it's really over the top, and it leads to some really hilarious moments. He does hit on Nami, who he's obsessed with in the anime and manga, and maybe they just wanted to tone that back because of its, like, 2023 sensibilities, which is fair enough. Now Sanjay here, he, he's more of a London white boy lad with a passion for cooking, and I couldn't help it yeah, but he reminded me of Will Poulter's character in The Bear Season 2. Sanji was a helper in the kitchen on a ship before it was raided by Zeph and his cook pirates, and the pair ended up shipwrecked on an island for a very long time. Zeph lied about having rations as he wanted the kid to survive, and in the end he ate his own leg before the pair were rescued. Sanji's aim in life is to find the Old Blue, a place of bountiful ingredients and fish and seen by others. We had to see it in the source material, but you know, with the show slightly altering things, then we might get some teasers towards it. Now a really cool detail is he actually just uses his feet to fight, and this is something known as the Black Leg style, which was created by Zef. Now things change up heavily at these locations, as Arlong appears much, much earlier. Just like the anime, Luffy ends up not having enough money to pay for his food, and he has to work off the debt by working in the kitchen. Found it kind of funny how the rest of the crew just got drinks after this, while he had to stand and clean the plates for a year. Inflation, yeah, it's re really got these restaurant prices going up, eh? Pre Preheat the oven? In this economy? Here yeah, we're also properly introduced to Mihawk, and see him going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Zoro, which leads to Zoro losing badly. The action though, it was very, very well done and makes the lightsaber fights in Ahsoka look like the Star Wars kid as the three sword style translated really well to live action. We also learned during this that Buggy's had his ear and Luffy's had all this time, which looking back was pretty ingenious. Now it's at this point that, you know, Zoro's injured, the whole thing with Buggy, and we also learn that Nami's actually working alongside Arlong. In the end, Zeph finally gives his blessing to Sanji to go off and join the crew, urging him to go out and live his life and not stay with a bunch of outcasts. It all comes to a head in the final episode as the crew arrive to save Nami from Arlong. Now here, Nami's tricked by Arlong and Izumi, and we get a moment where Luffy emotionally gets her to not give up. Luffy ends up defeating Arlong in the final fight, which looks stunning again, and I was genuinely surprised at how good the CGI was right through the entire season. Garp and Luffy then have their showdown, which actually happened much later in the anime. Luffy's laugh is just like Goldie Rogers, and it makes Garp realise how serious that he is. <laughs> now while Garp has been training Luffy his whole life, he knows he won't change and become a marine. He says that he wanted to make sure that Luffy knew who he was, because Garp actually knows his entire lineage. We'll talk about that more in the spoilers section, but when you, when you learn about his history, you know he won't become a marine, and that, that he was always destined to become a great pirate. Now we get Nami saying goodbye to the home she only just returned to, and see a pinwheel left at her adopted mother's grave made out of mic and peels. She gets her own mic and grove on the ship like the anime, and in the source material, a pinwheel was actually something Genzo wore in his hat. This was so that he could cheer up a younger Nami, and I really appreciated how they brought across this imagery. We also see her change her tattoo to a pinwheel just like the anime, and this shows where her allegiances really lie. Now with Arlong defeated, the crew are off to the Grand Line, and we see his Monkey D now has his first bounty on his head. This happened during Logtown in the anime, and it might have you wondering, what's next for Season 2? Well as mentioned, we were missing the Logtown part of the East Blue Saga, and this is located in the Pole Star Islands, which can be seen in the credits images. The stud of the saga does feature in the show, with Mihawk delivering the bounty poster to Shanks and the crew looking over it. The tease of the man looking over Luffy's bounty is a man named Smoker, and he gives Garp a run for his money in being a badass. Now the crew head to the place where Goldie Rogers was killed at the stud of the series, and this is to get supplies to then enter the Grand Line. I mean, Zoro needs some swords, and it's here that they come face to face with Smoker. He's a vice admiral of the marines and commander of the G5 base, and he tries to take out the crew with his second in command. This is Tashigi, with the G5 being shown on the GOP ship's mast. And we also see Buggy and Alvida forming an alliance at the end, and they're also some of the antagonists that the crew encounter at Logtown. Alvida at this point becomes dramatically different, having eaten the Soup Soup Nomi devil fruit that makes her slippery and slimmer. We also learned just what our boy Garp meant when he said that he always knew what Luffy is, as that kind of actually has a little bit of a double meaning. 
Now we will be spoiling what that is for the next part of the video, so if you don't want that ruined, because let's be honest, if you're this far into the video, you're invested in the show, then check out now and thank you for checking us out. The thumbs up as always is much appreciated and make sure you subscribe to join one piece of our crew. But out of the way, heavy spoilers ahead and yeah, let's get into what Garp really meant. Now Luffy's father and Garp's son is Monkey D. Dragon, a freedom fighter desperate to overthrow the world government. He saw them as corrupt, horrible and shady as hell and yet yeah, let's be honest that's kind of the case too. Now the first rulers founded the world government 800 years ago as an alliance to combat the great kingdom. This coincides with 100 years before that known as the void century where all history was wiped out before the world as we know it was formed. Talking and researching about that century is deadly and this is slowly unraveled by Nico Robin, a major character yet to appear in the show but she becomes just as integral as any other member of the Straw Hat crew. About Logtown is just one arc as we blitz through the arcs this season, and the next arc is the sweeping epic Arabasta. The first arc of this was teased as Nami looks at the map and she's confused at a river that goes up into the mountain. That's exactly what she says as it forms the entrance to the Grand Line in the opening arc of Arabasta, the reverse mountain arc, which yeah, make that make sense. Now the villain of the saga are Baroque's works, who were teased with Zoro meeting one of them and Garp's right hand man mentioning them a few times. They're a crime syndicate set up by one of the warlords of the sea crocodile to take over the kingdom of Arabasta and gain an ancient weapon known as the Pluton. The warlords are allied to the world government which is what Garp and Helmepo hinted at when they said the world is complicated. Now the ancient weapons are a long running mystery and due to their power used as an excuse by the world government to forbid research into the void century. I expect the first episode of season 2 will be Logtown as we then meet the princess of Arabasta who at first works for Baroque Works. That'll then tell the whole Arabasta rock with Crocodile working as the big bad for that season and we'll uncover his secret plans to rule Arabasta. Even the final arc of the Arabasta saga where the crew try to prevent a ruinous war, that could be its own season in a way but I do kind of feel like they'll condense it into just one overarching season. Whew, and that's the all of our One Piece ending explained in season 2 predictions. The show is a true love letter to the anime and to me it's going to become the blueprint for live action anime adaptations. This is what you get when you respect the source material and have the original creators involved to work on the show as well. I think the season really sung and you know it's one of those things where you you binge through it and when it ends you just feel really really sad. It's like you know when um, Kit Harrington described reading a good book and compared that to Game of Thrones. Well it's not like Game of Thrones, it's not like that finale because that left me disappointed but this just left me feeling sad that we're going to have to wait so long to see these characters again. I think they absolutely nailed it, you know, this was a dream come true and it's so amazing seeing this brought to live action. I did think when it started off that they were kind of missing the mark a bit, um, but you know, by the end of the first episode I was completely on board and if I have any criticisms, yeah, it would be those that minor thing where it just took me time to adjust. I think any time when you're doing an anime so closely, you know, it might seem a bit jarring because they're obviously not pushing for full realism, but... Once you get on board with it, I think everyone's going to love it. This is truly one of my favourite shows on Netflix ever, and yeah, I'm so glad that they delivered to the level that they should have. This just goes to show exactly why Netflix is still the king of the streamers, and when they're knocking out things like this, it's really hard to fault them. I know they've had a lot of issues in the past, especially those live action adaptations, but watching it here, it's very difficult to fault it. I have been saying for a while that once the comic book movie genre dies out, that they're the industry is going to shift towards video games, but seeing how much they nailed it here, I think that might not be the case. I could easily see Hollywood going into live action animes just based off how good this is alone. And yeah, what a way to capture the look and feel of the source material. Now obviously, I'm sure you can tell I loved it, but if you have a different opinion or if you agree, then let me know below in the comments section. Please drop a like, and if you want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society, then please click the join button. You get early access to videos like this every week and we've got lots of things coming from the world of Monkey D. Luffy. If you want to get some heavy spoilers merch we've also just launched an Ahsoka t-shirt that will be linked right below the video and we've also got things like our theory time shirt, heavy spoilers shirt and a lot more. We drop new designs on there all the time so definitely keep an eye out for them and yeah huge thank you to everyone that picks one up. Now if you want something else to watch we've got a breakdown of Ahsoka on screen right now going over all the things in the latest episode. We will be back to talk about some of the easter eggs in this series and make sure you just make sure you keep an eye out for all the content we've got coming your way. Huge thank you for sticking through the video. In the end I've been Paul, you've been the best and I'll see you next time.
Take care. Peace.